<laughs> so when we break down this average switching model, where we have a uh, output of our square wave is equivalent to the average of our output, is equivalent to the average of the duty cycle and the age. It's the stuff, the classic stuff. Thank you. Um, the average of our square waves, the average of the duty cycles, and our voltage input. So we have here, we can break this down into the average of the square wave is uh, the average plus small deviations, where we're assuming that the small deviation is much smaller than the average of that output. Again, we do this for the duty cycle, where D is equal to the average is equal to our steady state value plus small deviations, where the small deviations are much less than our uh, uh, steady state. Same thing with our input voltage. Uh, again, we have steady state input with small deviations that are much smaller than uh, the um, steady state value. So we can break this down. Uh, We've just turned this average into an average of steady state and deviation, which you can see broken down here. Same thing with our duty cycle, steady state, and small deviations, and our input, small deviations and steady state. When you do this multiplication, we end up with our DC steady state term plus our first order terms and then we have our uh, small variations multiplied together, these higher uh, nonlinear terms. So the product of two small signal variations will be small. So going forward, we'll neglect this nonlinear term. Mm -hmm. In this way, by neglecting what we know to be very small deviations, we can linearize this equation, giving us uh, zero order term here on both sides, giving us our DC model. And since the low pass filter has the DC gain of unity, neglecting losses in this case, the DC converter output voltage is given by V equals VS. And VS would be equal to the steady state duty cycle and the voltage input. So now we're gonna break it into the first order terms. So we have our small variation to our square wave it is equivalent to the variation in the input and our steady state duty cycle and uh, our steady state input and variations, small variations in that duty cycle. So we can equate these where when the, there are no variations in the duty cycle, uh, small variations in the output over the small variations in the input will equal our uh, duty cycle steady state. Likewise, with the small variation input to our small variation output should still have a value of our steady state uh, input voltage. So it's assuming in this case that there are no variations in that input. So we can isolate each of these into values. So we have our transfer function, VGS, which would be our uh, variations over the variations in our uh, input voltage. So transfer function breaks it down here. The transfer function quantifies how variations in that input voltage propagate out to appear as variations in the output. So the inputs uh, VG hat represents, in this case, a disturbance signal or something being added into uh, the input there. So we have our transfer function VDS, which would be the transfer function quantifying how variations in the duty ratio propagate out to appear as variations in the output voltage, where duty ratio D hat represents the control signal. We break this into the system transfer functions. Again, we have uh, VGS, or sorry, G, VG transfer function, 
which I'm gonna hop on over, is the steady state duty cycle times the gain of the low pass filter, the transfer function. Um, but you can see it broken down here into um, variations in the inputs. Oh, I start at the top. Variations in the square wave output over variations in the input times uh, the small variations in the output over small variations in the square wave. These will cancel out, leaving us with that V um, output over input. So variations in the output related to a variation in the input. And we do the same thing here for uh, GVD. So here we have variations in the duty cycle uh, under the variations in the output. So duty cycle changes to output transfer function, which will be our uh, steady or yeah, steady state input voltage times the gain of that low pass filter. And again, if we have a low pass filter at unity, this would become one. So now we're gonna get into this output section of the buck converter, which is the low pass filter. So we have the gain of the low pass filter is equal to one over one plus S over omega zero Q plus S over omega zero squared. With omega zero being the uh, uh, corner frequency and uh, the Q value being calculated as the square root of the LC circuit over the uh, ESR of that inductor times capacitor plus L over the output resistor here. What is the Q? I'm trying to remember what it is. Uh, Q quality factor is quality, quality factor. factor, thank you. Um, but it is a calculation based on these uh, the LC low pass filter circuit. I can't remember offhand. Um, it's called quality factor, but um, I think we're kind of getting to the where we can relate that almost to the uh, zeta that I brought up in the transient analysis. Um, so it kind of affects the overdamped, underdamped qualities of this and what this will be a second order system. Did that help? Did I explain it a little better? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we have our uh, system transfer function. So we have the effect of the output current variations. So if our load suddenly changes, we would have a change in our output current uh, causing voltage variations in our uh, output. And it's quanti quantified by the transfer function negative Z out. Uh, the input I.O. represents a disturbance signal in this case, so the current suddenly changing at our output. So Z out can be equated to our output voltage over any change in the uh, output current. Let's break this down a little bit more in these subsequent slides. So we're bringing this into, again, uh, trying to linearize this as our first sub-interval -inter is when we have the uh, switch turned on, is what I'll call it now, and we have our full voltage flowing in. The second value is our <coughs> second sub-interval, and that's when the switch is off, and therefore we have zero voltage being entered in there. So we can calculate Z out as uh, frequency domain as SL plus the RL, the equivalent series resistance here, in parallel with the capacitor, in parallel with our output resistor, which we can break this down into in the quality factor, cutoff frequency, and then the values of our uh, inductor and uh, resistance. And we see the quality factor Q, square root of LC, doesn't change here. Um, the only thing that would change in our calculations here is if we didn't include this equivalent series resistance here. 
So now we're going to bring in to our system the pulse width modulator. So our control, this will be used in uh, how we control this duty cycle. The control to output transfer function can be related as uh, GVD times the gain of that pulse width modulator, which written down, we change the small variations. The D hat can be also called, I think it's mentioned in a few slides previous, as the control duty cycle. So we're making that control there um, to alternate how quickly this signal is turning on and off. So the pulse width modulator has a describing function of the uh, output duty cycle or variation of small signal variation, so slight disturbance in the duty cycle over the input of that uh, square wave. The modulator consists of a comparator where driven by the sawtooth waveform, I think I described that in that homework problem, so we're comparing the sawtooth wave to an input uh, control signal depending on where that input control signal hits the uh, rising or falling edge of the sawtooth wave. I did not go on a tangent just yet. I need to think of something else I'm gonna write down. Um, but we have a comparator here that will give us a uh, square wave duty cycle that will control the on-off switching frequency here. And that really depends, as you can see here, this control voltage signal is varying along the peak-to-peak uh, uh, -peak sawtooth wave, and as it crosses each point, you can see as on the falling edge, we get a rising edge clock signal, you could call it clock signal. Um, duty cycle is probably a better term for that. And then on the rising edge of the sawtooth wave, we get down to zero here. So you see as the input control signal changes, we end up with wider and wider uh, duty cycle values, or I guess higher duty cycle values. So uh, thing to be aware of here is this peak to peak amplitude of the sawtooth wave, we'll describe as V sub M. So, using a Fourier analysis of the waveform produced by the pulse width modulator, the describing function is derived. So, the result of that uh, describing function uh, gives the frequency response of the fundamental component of the output spectrum. So, we're just looking at the fundamental there, and the result giving us a gain of 1 over Vm. So, if we have, uh, I believe we have the um, five volt peak to peak uh, pulse width modulator in the lab, so that pulse width modulator would in itself have a gain or transfer function of one over Vm. Since you use five volts, that would be one over five. Um, if we get to building the circuit in the lab, we end up going with a uh, 15 volt sawtooth wave but we'll get more into that. But that kind of shows you the, the gain of that, uh, of this system, not system, of the gain of the pulse width modulator. So the transfer function of our pulse width modulator. I keep wanting to call it gain, but that's probably dangerous. So we have a summary of all the transfer functions that have just been just been described by this linearization of the nonlinear switching. So GVD, as I described before, is our uh, change in uh, output voltage over a variation in the duty cycle. So this would be. Uh, So that's the input voltage over any change in the S domain. Um, GVG 
would be our output voltage over, I wish I should have left those hats in there, a small deviation in the output voltage over a deviation in our input voltage, which we've described as D over delta of S, frequency domain. Z out, as we described, as I described previously, is the any change in the load. So that is any small deviation in the current of the load over the output. I'm doing it this way. Sorry if that keeps being confusing. Deviation in the output over any deviation in the current going through the output, which can be described by the relationship of the uh, equivalent series resistance and that inductor, in our case, over that equivalent series resistance over any change in the S domain. And just descriptive of the gain of the pulse width modulator is any variation in the duty, average variation in the duty cycle over average variation in the uh, square wave that's input which breaks down as the transfer function of one over VM, with VM being the peak-to-peak uh, 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 -peak voltage of that pulse width modulator. See here, delta S is described by the Q factor and the cutoff voltage of our low-pass system. So here is a breakdown modeling of our open loop transfer functions. So we have our pulse width modulator going into the gain VD that's summed with the any variation in the input, small variations in the input going into uh, this transfer function, summing it in, and then any changes in our uh, current going into the transfer function of what our output is, you know, the transfer function of our output is subtracted, all giving us the small variations, the you know, average of the small variations of our output. A lot of words there. I keep feeling like I'm being confusing about this. Are there any questions on that? Should we memorize all of the formula of this lecture? Um, be familiar with them. I'm not gonna ask you to derive them directly, okay. but I'd say it's definitely very helpful to be aware that the transfer function of the pulse width modulator is one over the peak-to-peak -peak voltage. Um, I would say this, and I, if I had to do this, and possibly if they asked me to come back in the fall and do this, I'm probably going to just directly input this delta S here. I would put these, probably have all of these written out on your cheat sheet to have okay. here. Um, just as a reference, I would say that's good. But I don't think, I'm not going to have anything where I'm going to actually have you calculate the negative Z out. I might ask something about if we have a pulse width modulator of 15 volt peak to peak, I'd especially to give me the transfer function value of that. So that's a nice easy one that if you have it written down, should be a very quick answer. That okay. would probably be a good one that I'd have. Um, but um, unless I come up with something very simple for Q and zero calculations, I wouldn't expect to be calculating that, but I might have something along the lines of, um, the Z out function, and then I write out these uh, the equation itself, or possibly write out it with some slight variation that isn't correct. Might be like a true and false kind of thing. Like, is this the Z out uh, equation, um, okay. or something to the effect of uh, was the the formula for uh, quality factor? probably do something with a little extra when we have no equivalent series resistance, which would mean it'd be everything here LC without RL in that case. Okay. Because that inductor, I'm, I'm making the assumption that inductor has zero ESR, but that's not going to be the case in the real world. But 
that's where I would put something like that to make sure that I'd say make sure you're familiar with these equations. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you for bringing that up. The V hat and like I hat is how is that measured in the output? Like, what am I looking at um, when I see a wave? What does it look like? Which you would see those variations in the uh, let's see. Z out would affect uh, probably a jump in what we would call the steady state error. Um, if I remember correctly, I didn't mm -hmm. check on that. But the, any change in the load resistance would result in either a step up in the output voltage, uh, or the output current, I should say, or depending on if it goes up. If the, if the resistance suddenly changed to a smaller value, mm -hmm. you would obviously see the current jump up. If it went to a uh, higher value, which is what we'll be doing, we'll be switching between a 5 ohm and 25. And a 5 ohm and a 20 ohm that's either in the circuit or not. So it's either 5 or 25 there. So we would see a jump down in current. And when I see that, that's something I can measure to infer like V hat or V hat or something? Yes. Um, that open. But, but yes, you'll be able to observe, uh, especially a good one, I think the, the simplest one is probably observing a change in the input voltage mm -hmm. while measuring the output or not alternating the input voltage and then seeing how that results in the output. So. If we do lab two, we'll be setting up PEX to jump the input between 10 and 11 volts, yeah. and then measuring that output voltage, and also seeing how, depending on the frequency, you might be able to capture all the transient, or if you're switching, your frequency is too high, and you're switching back down to a lower voltage, you might miss the whole transient too. Uh, but it would be uh, measurable at the output. Mm -hmm. um, that's also, I appreciate you bringing that up because that's also like what we're kind of building to with a lot of these simulations is setting up the simulation, being aware of how this might shift our output, and then putting it all together onto a physical circuit and physically me measuring those and seeing how that varies from what our calculations, simulations, and the real world actually comes to. How switching changes the magnitude of the output. Of the output, yeah. yes. Yeah, because you can, uh, another part of that, and again, I'm hoping we get to build, I, I love building things, so I'm hoping we can get to that, but uh, they're making me nervous with not having it finished yet. Um, I wish I would have told them to scope my build from last year and we'll deal with it, um, but we're here now. But uh, but yeah, it's I, I enjoy playing with the circuit and debugging and uh, figuring things out like that. So. When setting up this initial circuit, you'll build it step by step. Uh, I suggest following along if we get to lab three. Um, I just built everything when I first put it, I just like putting it together. Then I started testing. Uh, I got lucky that when I first built it a few years ago, it ended up working. It's very easy to make mistakes when soldering some of these. And out of curiosity, who has experienced soldering? Very good, okay, good, good. It's helpful, um, but I definitely had uh, and noticed uh, quite a few people uh, in my class when we took it had no clue how to solder. Um, I was a little surprised about. Um, but it's a great skill to have. I mean, I'm almost considering moving the whole thing to surface mounted devices because I like using those and they're easy to switch on and off. Uh, we're still using through hole, which is easier to place because it's much larger, but uh, it's much more difficult to swap out components um, if you have experience with that. Um, any other questions? That was very helpful. I don't know if I got on a tangent though, because I feel like I did. Um, we're getting close to finishing this one up. Um, I think I already did this. Oh yeah, we're getting to the closed loop system. Okay, so finally getting to uh, the closed loop system. So initially, 
I wish you would have put both of them on here. Let's just go. This is our open loop system right now. There's no feedback. There's nothing to tell our comparator right now. Um, if I notice a change on the outputs, does that deviate from what we expect? This is currently an open loop here. When we close the loop here, you can see we're taking, before we go to our output, we've added in a voltage divider going into a comparator that's checking a uh, reference voltage, subtracting it from that. So then going into the feedback compensator, going into our pulse width modulator com comparator, and then that will alternate this, uh, we'll add in that small variation in the duty cycle that might be necessary to correct our system back to what we want it to be. And this is a pretty good diagram, um, but you won't be familiar with what we've done so far. I mean, this uh, is just a basic voltage divider right here, and we're subtracting uh, from a reference voltage that we feed back in the compensator. Here we have our <clears throat> closed loop block diagram. So now that we've uh, close the loop, we actually have feedback. So we have our input voltage, going into the summation here. Going into the compensator, which goes to the pulse width modulator. And from there, we go into the transfer, of, transfer function of our low pass filter. And we also have other disturbance signals that are being either added or subtracted here, giving us our average for the output voltage. And we can describe our feedback gain as, just in this case, the voltage division right there. So if we use two resistors of the same value, let's say one and one, what would our feedback gain be? One and one? Yes. And that's kind of what we're aiming for there too, um, is having that 50% duty cycle. So, I mean, this was a lot for this section to kind of summarize. We have our uh, DC to DC buck converter. The basic operations can be described as chopping up the input voltage and then filtering. So we're chopping up that input with that switch turning on and off, leaving us with a square wave output of the switch. Then filtering that square wave through the low pass filter that has a much smaller uh, cutoff frequency than our switching frequency, we end up with a uh, DC result uh, dependent on our uh, duty cycle. So we use above the Fourier analysis to determine the unfiltered residuals. This, this system, which all systems we'll be dealing with here are uh, single input, single output. We have one output uh, and the output voltage is described as, in this case, V. We identified inputs into this system. So we have uh, D hat as our duty ratio, which we'll also call the control input. Mm -hmm. V hat G, sub G, is input voltage, uh, disturbance at the input. And I hat O is output current, or a disturbance, uh, an input disturbance located at the output. We've also determined the three transfer functions for the converter being GBD, GBG, and Z out. And also described the, disc, uh, discussed the describing function analysis to model the pulse width modulator. And through a process that we called averaging and linearization, we ended up with a linear time invariant small signal model of the system that we uh, previously have described there. Next we'll get to stability analysis, but I don't, don't want to get into that today just yet. Um, 
I remember uh, I didn't follow up on this last Wednesday, but it seems a lot of you were confused or at least unfamiliar with uh, equation editor. Um, equation. So I just wanted to kind of describe this very briefly. Um, Word documents you can add in, in Purdue Power Students, LaTeX. Uh, you can also put in Unicode or LaTeX. Uh, I really don't want to touch LaTeX right now, though. I haven't touched it since I left school, so I won't touch it again. Uh, at least not anytime soon. But you can you, you can put in equations directly uh, using Word documents, um, depending on how you want that to be viewed. You also have common fractions, things like that. You can add this in. Let's say I want to put uh, some superscripts. You have a lot of options here. Um, I'm just bringing, I don't think I saw anybody use like shorthand format in the labs, but I didn't look through too uh, thoroughly. But I know some people put it in homeworks, but E, uh, carrot, E carrot minus JT or whatever. Um, and I just want to make sure that it's clear that's not really acceptable for the lab reports. I don't think I saw it in any of them, but I didn't look too thoroughly. Like I said, I did a quick once over, and like I said, I was very happy with seeing some of the results and things that you guys put in there. So I, I appreciate that, and I can see the hard work you guys put into that. So I appreciate that. Say I appreciate that at least 500 times. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, any quick questions on the using the equation editor? Um, I just remembered I hadn't brought the, finished up my thought on that last Wednesday when somebody had brought up that they didn't know what that was. Um, I love the equation editor. It's so fun to use. It, it's nice once you get familiar with it. It, it makes things easier. But yeah, it is. It it's so fun. It's. It's more professional than writing out. How about if I take a screenshot of the formula we need? It? <laughs> uh, and then input it there? Yeah. Uh, please don't. That looks, like, unless you have aligned that perfectly where you're gonna put it, or made it look very well, Okay. I wouldn't do that. I, I wouldn't appreciate seeing that. Um, okay. I would prefer, especially for the lab reports, for your homeworks, I don't care if you put it in the shorthand script. E and minus 2t or whatever, 27. Uh, but for the labs, I would expect you to use an equation editor if you're putting in an equation. Um, okay. If you really want to try and make it look really good and take the screenshot, make sure that screenshot lines up really nice so I can't even tell the difference, go ahead. Okay. But it better line up pretty nice and neat. Sure. Thank you. Um, I don't think I want to get into a new topic today, um, so I think I'm going to let you guys go a little early. Um, I Thank have you to so finish much. up some things at work. Did, did anybody need to see me for office hours today? Not yet, but definitely yet. <laughs> that is fair. Uh, so I will uh, try to put an announcement and add in a link for the Zoom call. Uh, Friday, I will record it and post it, um, and I will try and push, post a homework either tonight or tomorrow night, but it will have an extra uh, time to complete it. It won't be due before class. I will probably make it due at midnight on Monday. That way it gives you guys an extra day to ask a question if you need to on